In this presentation, the treatment of a Liz Frank injury will be demonstrated using open reduction and internal fixation ORIF, with 4.0 mm self-tapping cortex screws and a first TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking. Here we see examples of an AP and oblique view of a Liz Frank injury. In the AP view, it can be seen that the first MT is tipped off the medial cuneiform and the first TMT is tipped out of place. The 30 degree oblique view shows the second TMT displaced laterally. In the event of a high energy injury, the lateral profile might also be displaced with the MTs elevated. Upon completion of this exercise, you should be able to Recognize the biomechanics and injury patterns for surgery versus closed treatment. Perform the surgical reduction and fixation. And describe the post-operative rehabilitation. Clinical indications include failed closed reduction and percutaneous pin fixation, fractures presenting with any evidence of instability, in other words, measuring greater than 2 mm of displacement, and 15 degrees of TMT angulation, bony fracture dislocations, ligamentous arch injuries, delayed treatment, and chronic deformity. The patient is positioned supine. The surgeon is seated near the foot of the table and might move from medial to lateral depending on whether working from dorsomedial, from dorsolateral, or from distal. For this demonstration, the foot is positioned flat on the table. The joints are marked on the skin. The dorsomedial incision follows near to the extensor hallucis longus or EHL tendon and is marked with a dotted line. The dorsolateral incision is roughly in line with the fourth metatarsal. The path of this incision is marked on the skin. One goal of the approach is to preserve a healthy skin bridge between the incisions. So the incisions might be made a bit more medial or a bit more lateral than has been marked here in order to maintain as large a skin bridge as possible. The incision should be made straight down from skin to periosteum without raising flaps or any unnecessary dissection. Here it can be seen that the skin incision is made slightly medial to the line marked on the skin. The skin is gently retracted, taking care not to pull and rip the soft tissue. The dissection is continued, paying attention to avoid any injury to the vascular structures as the EHL tendon comes into view. It can be seen that the skin incision may be slightly medial to the trajectory of the EHL, which is indicated here by the scalpel and diverges from the skin incision. Soft tissue dissection is continued by following the trajectory of the EHL, which is readily apparent and indicated here. The retractor is repositioned and the EHL is gently retracted. Here we can see a part of the vascular tree. In a clinical setting, electrocautery would be used as necessary. Care is taken to avoid injury to the neurovascular bundle that runs between the first and second metatarsals. The retractor is repositioned. The extensor hallucis brevis or EHB tendon is exposed. The great toe is manipulated to show the movement of the tendons. And the EHB tendon is manipulated to show the movement of the great toe. The retractor is repositioned and the tendons are retracted to expose the interval between them. If better visualization is needed, the incision can be extended a bit proximally by following the trajectory of the EHL. The tendons are retracted to increase the exposure of the interval between them. In the case of a Lisfranc injury, there would be disruption and hematoma. The periosteum can be seen. Here we see the first TMT, the intertarsal area, 
and the medial half of the second TMT. While trying to maintain a sleeve of soft tissue, the flat of the scalpel blade is used in a filleting motion to strip the periosteum. In clinical practice, care is taken to avoid the neurovascular bundle here. This is achieved by following the surface of the bone and periosteum. It is now easier to visualize the medial half of the second TMT, the intertarsal area, and the first TMT. These areas are highlighted with a blue surgical marker to improve visibility. It should be noted that the second TMT is slightly more proximal than the first TMT. To help visualize this relationship, chisel blades are inserted into the first TMT and the second TMT and image intensification is used. The bone spreader is inserted to show the simulated instability indicative of a Liz Frank injury, specifically in the area indicated here between the medial cuneiform and the base of the second metatarsal. The retractor is removed. We will now proceed with the dorsolateral approach. The skin incision is made roughly in line with the fourth metatarsal. In order to ensure the best possible reduction and maximize the success of the ORIF, small keyhole incisions and percutaneous fixation are not recommended. The skin is retracted and the long extensor tendons to the lesser toes can be seen. The dissection is continued and the tendons retracted. To help improve visualization, the incision may be extended proximally. In a clinical setting, this may not be necessary. However, perfect anatomical reduction is crucial and visualization facilitates that, so the incision should be extended when needed. It can be seen that the axis of the metatarsals are not straight down, but rather inward. The dissection is continued more medially, taking care not to raise any flaps in the skin by remaining just on the periosteum. The skin bridge is protected by the dorsal artery of the foot, so as long as you are not too vigorous there, you should be safe. The lateral half of the second TMT joint is visualized by inserting an osteotome into the joint from medial to lateral, taking care not to abuse or undermine the skin bridge. The base of the second TMT is followed to identify the third TMT. The chisel is used to recreate the injury that would be present in a clinical setting. Chisel blades are inserted into the second and third TMT joints to help visualize the relationship and image intensification is used. The next step will be the reduction and then the fixation of the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsal. The bone model is secured in the clamp. 
The bone spreader is used to show the simulated medial column instability between the first and second metatarsal. The simulated attachment is stretched. The chisel is used to release this simulated attachment. The simulated intertarsal instability and instability of the base of the second metatarsal from the medial cuneiform can be seen. If there is additional instability more proximally, it would possibly be in the region of the intermetatarsal area between medial and intermediate cuneiform here, between the middle and the lateral cuneiform here, and even along the navicular cuneiform level here. This additional instability must be addressed before a definitive ORIF can be completed. In the case of intercuneiform instability, a K-wire can be inserted for provisional stabilization before the definitive ORIF is performed. The K-wire is inserted from the medial cuneiform and directed rather dorsal because there are a number of structures more plantar that should be avoided. The K-wire has addressed the instability between the cuneiforms, but not the Lisfranc instability, which is located here. So the next step is to address the Lisfranc instability. A K-wire is used to create a small conical recess in the cortex to seat the point of the reduction forceps. A second recess is created in the cortex of the medial cuneiform. The large pointed reduction forceps is applied and the Lisfranc injury is reduced by tightening the forceps. The reduction is secured with the ratchet lock. The Lisfranc instability has now been addressed. It can be seen that the base of the second metatarsal has been seated into this keystone corner here. The next step will be to fix the reduction with a self-tapping cortex screw inserted as a lag screw from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsal. This screw has a 4.0 mm thread diameter and a 2.9 mm core diameter. It is important to note that the thread hole will be drilled using a 2.5 mm drill bit through the 2.9 mm sleeve and that the bone is very soft. It is not really hard cortical bone, but rather soft cancellous bone, more like a shell with a soft interior. Since the thread hole is smaller than the core diameter of the screw, the screw will radially push the cancellous bone outward. This differs from standard AO technique, in which the thread hole is drilled to the core diameter of the screw. The screw is inserted a little plantar and aimed a little superior. The 4.0 mm glide hole is drilled in the medial cuneiform through the 4.0 end of the double drill guide. The 2.5 mm drill bit is slid through the 2.9 end of the double drill guide and inserted into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the drill guide. The end of the drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5 mm drill bit. After the hole has been drilled, the 2.9 mm end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the 4.0 mm hole. The depth is measured with the depth gauge. In this case, the depth is 34 mm. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0 mm cortex screw is inserted. 
As this is a lag screw, the base of the second metatarsal is pulled toward the medial cuneiform. The pointed reduction forceps are removed. The next step is to address the reduction of the first TMT joint. To provide increased leverage and prevent cortical breakoff, the burr will be used to create a pocket hole for the head of the screw at a distance of 2 cm from the joint. A 4.0 mm screw will be inserted across the joint using the previously described technique. It is important to note that the bone is very soft. It is not really hard cortical bone, but rather soft cancellous bone, more like a shell with a soft interior. Since the thread hole is smaller than the core diameter of the screw, the screw will radially push the cancellous bone outward. This differs from standard AO technique, in which the thread hole is drilled to the core diameter of the screw. Two centimeters are measured from the joint and marked on the bone. A burr of sufficient size to create the pocket hole is used. Here, a burr of 5 mm is used. In the clinic, a burr with a diameter of 6 mm or 8 mm might also be used. To help with visualization, the pocket hole has been marked in red. The 4.0 mm glide hole is drilled to the base of the first TMT joint. The tip is aimed plantar medial to exit the corner of the medial cuneiform. The 2.9 end of the double drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5 mm drill bit. A 2.5 mm thread hole is drilled from the base of the first TMT joint to the plantar medial corner of the base of the medial cuneiform. After the hole has been drilled, the 2.9 mm end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the 4.0 mm hole. The depth is measured. In this case, the length is 44 mm. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0 mm cortex screw is inserted. For the purpose of this exercise, to prevent rotation, one participant can stabilize the first TMT while the screw is inserted. As an option, if the second TMT is very unstable, a K-wire can be inserted for temporary fixation, or in the clinic, an appropriate diameter screw can be inserted using the previously described technique. In this case, it's stable enough that a K-wire is not needed. The next step is to address the reduction of the third TMT joint. The previously described technique is repeated. A pocket hole for the screw head is made with the burr and marked in red. In the clinical setting, there may be indication where a smaller diameter screw is advisable for the third MT. The screw can be aimed for the lateral cuneiform. The assistant provides stabilization distally. It can be seen that the trajectory is very flat, as a more vertical trajectory would miss the bottom of the cuneiform. The 4.0 mm glide hole is drilled to the base of the third TMT joint. The 2.9 end of the double drill guide is wriggled into the 4.0 mm hole to guide the insertion of the 2.5 mm drill bit. 
A 2.5 mm thread hole is drilled from the base of the third TMT joint to the base of the lateral cuneiform. The end of the double drill guide is wriggled out of the hole. The depth is measured. Screws can be inserted into the navicular to further stabilize the foot in the case of intertarsal instability. The appropriate length self-tapping 4.0 mm cortex screw is inserted. These screws have been inserted as lag screws because with these non-essential joints, stiffening or even auto-fusing is acceptable as motion need not be maintained here, especially in a post-traumatic injury. In many instances, fusion can actually be desirable. The remaining K-wire is removed. In a clinical situation with ORIF of TMT 1, 2 and 3, the lateral column can be stabilized with an additional K-wire inserted from the base of the fifth MT into the cuboid. The wire is bent and cut. This K-wire can be removed postoperatively at six to eight weeks. If there is comminution of the base of the second metatarsal that precludes the use of a screw from the medial cuneiform to the second MT, a dorsal spanning plate may be used. Plates can also be used to salvage a failed pocket hole. The plates include the TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking and the first TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking, which will be shown. The plate is positioned and provisionally attached using the compression wires. The compression forceps can then be used to provide additional compression if needed. Either a coaxial or variable angle drill guide may be utilized with the 2.0 mm drill bit to prepare the screw holes for the locking screws. The conical variable angle drill guide allows for 15 degrees off of center in any direction. The variable angle technique can be used to direct some of the plate screws into the intercuniform area and some of the screws all the way across the intertarsal region for greater construct stability. The screws will be inserted in the following order. The first screw hole is drilled using the conical VALCP drill sleeve to direct the 2.0 mm drill bit into the intertarsal region. In the clinical setting, the desired angle would be verified under image intensification. The drill sleeve is removed. The screw hole is measured with the depth gauge to determine the length of the screw. A self-tapping 2.7 mm VA locking screw is inserted using the star drive screwdriver shaft and torque limiting handle. The second screw hole is drilled nominally using the 2.7 mm drill sleeve to direct the 2.0 mm drill bit. A self-tapping 2.7 mm VA locking screw of the appropriate length is inserted using the star drive screwdriver shaft and torque limiting handle. The compression wires are removed. The remaining screw holes are drilled, measured and filled with 2.7 mm VA locking screws. The completed construct is shown here. Clinically, it may be possible to use differing combinations of screws and plates. Here, 
a TMT fusion plate 2.4-2.7 VA locking has been secured to the second ray using a compression wire. A comminuted area is indicated in blue at the base of the second metatarsal. In this case, the TMT fusion plate would be inappropriate as the most proximal screw in the distal plate segment would fall into the comminuted area and would not obtain purchase in the bone. A longer plate would be needed to cross the comminuted area and allow for sufficient screw purchase in the distal plate segment. Here, a T-fusion plate 2.4-2.7 is shown. It can be seen in profile that the plate will need to be plantar flexed to fit the anatomy. After contouring, the T-fusion plate has been secured to the second ray with a compression wire. It can be seen that there are a sufficient number of screw holes in the distal end of the plate. Here we see the post-operative weight-bearing AP, lateral and oblique views from a clinical case, in which a Lisfranc injury was treated with plate fixation. In the AP view, we can see that the first TMT is fixed with the plate and side screws. The lateral view shows there is excellent alignment with no dorsal displacement. In the oblique view, the reduction at the base of the second and third metatarsals can be seen. The lateral border of the base of the second metatarsal aligns with the lateral base of the intermediate cuneiform and the base of the third metatarsal aligns with the lateral border of the lateral cuneiform. Post-operative care includes a plaster splint for two weeks, a controlled ankle motion boot with controlled range of motion but strict non-weight bearing for 6 to 12 weeks, progressive weight bearing with possible removal of hardware at 3 or more months or allow hardware to remain in place as these are non-essential joints and removal of K-wires if used after 6 to 8 weeks. You should now be able to recognize the biomechanics and injury patterns for surgery versus closed treatment, perform the surgical reduction and fixation, and describe the post-operative rehabilitation.